Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we'll bring you another special, uh, almost two hour long conversation about the mechanics and principles of information psychological special ops and how they work when they actually get to our heads. This conversation happened on Alpha Omega channel uh, by Yuri Romanenko, who is leading it, and uh, he's discussing that with Alexei Rostovich, former advisor to the office of the president of Ukraine, Lieutenant Colonel. Sergei Datsuk, Ukrainian philosopher, and uh, Nikolai Feldman, a prominent Ukrainian blogger and journalist. Enjoy. All right, I think I see you all. Aristovich is eating something tasty. He's eating thanks to whom? Dmitry Piratovsky from France sent today very tasty cakes for me, but traditionally in our country, it's not only the one who is uh, the addressee of the goods, uh, it's the others who are in the right place at the right time, often consume the, the goods. Um, so thank you, Dmitry, for taking care of uh, us, and we are taking care of you in return. This is our um, slogan of the day at Alpha and Omega channel. Today, I think we'll have a good stream. I picked uh, a special topic. I called it uh, hygiene of thinking and uh, thinking process. How does information psychological op works and how does it destroy the goodness in people? We discussed why and why did it uh, choose it. We, in the earlier streams, discussed the topic of strong, pretty strong information psychological warfare that is being unfolded now onto Ukraine. And many people are defenseless in front of that because unlike me or Alexei or uh, Nikolai, they don't understand uh, simple things. How do you recognize manipulation? How do you recognize that you are being puppeted by uh, some hand? And how does that system work? And how do you build up the thought hygiene, which is usually impossible without uh, Thinking skills. Who is the boss on thinking in Ukraine? Sergei Datsuk, the philosopher, is with us. So I would suggest topics, how to set these filters in your mind, how to work with manipulations, and how to avoid mental, psychological, and other traps that are being set not only by our Russian foes, but uh, in general, your opponents uh, at large in uh, your daily life. And I think we'll talk about that today, and uh, it is a rather interesting topic. So do you want me to ask somebody something? All right. Sergei uh, Arkadyevich, why do you, what, what thoughts do you have that you were just announced to be the first uh, on uh, the thinking department in Ukraine? All right. I'll try to smile here and say that Thinking is uh, like uh, a woman who lives with whom she wants, how she wants, and when she wants. And the fact that uh, it is present with certain people doesn't mean that it's going to stay there. If somebody had uh, pretty deep thinking yesterday, um, or was doing that, uh, he may not be doing it today. It depends how you look at the person, because thinking and change are... Uh, absolutely connected and one can say that change happens because of thinking so if today a person found himself in a situation of change where he had to think and analyze but one needs to understand that thinking is a very intense process it's very energy consuming yes uh sergey it's also anti-evolutionary it's an anti-evolutionary concept, which actually eats a lot of energy. How do you mean? Well, thinking, daily da daily routines is one thing, but uh, the process of actually philosophizing and thinking, it is uh, very energy consuming and doesn't necessarily bring immediate benefits. So, very special topic. All right, so as I was uh, watching an interview with uh, Inga Miseria, and reading the comments, and Alexei was talking about the tactics of Russians, how they changed from well-equipped with the heavy artillery army 
to a war with small groups where you actually meet your enemy face to face. And this is a very characteristic uh, aspect of situations where you can, where you're eager to waste thousands of people, just uh, throw corpses at your enemy. So that's the situation on the front. But behind the front lines, he did make another post that it doesn't work like that, that somebody will come, like, for example, these officers and soldiers from the front changed, come back to the country and they will give us a new model, a new concept that will switch to and be thinking and analyzing and seeing the world better. It doesn't work like that. Everything is connected and we often see a situation when you try to inject grander schemes, bigger models, bigger, larger views, very often collapse when they are thrown at the society. An attempt to bring that to Rammstein, to our allies and to others very often doesn't fly as well immediately because it takes an effort to see that. And very often you end up being having to go to the same tactics of small groups, the ones that can see that, the one that can dis the ones that can discuss these ideas. The disorientation we're facing today is because our thinking massives are changing. At large, we had generally two lines of thinking in this country. One of them was a Soviet or imperial. That was one. The other was uh, designed as a post-Soviet, uh, post-Soviet massive and philosophy and everything. It started rapidly in the 90s, but at the early 2000s, it collapsed. And factually, post-Soviet Russian cultural massive was never built. And what we're seeing now, what we're observing today, it's imperial. It's not even Soviet, it's pre-Soviet imperial. And the other group was formed by National Patriotic Movement. At some point, uh, there were national elements, nationalist elements involved in that. Uh, then it graduated into National Patriotic wider movement. And uh, the war posed a lot of things. Can you remove the monuments? Yeah. You can uh, police the language? Yeah. But can you fight the enemy? Can you use missiles? Can you use tanks? Can you stop the foe that wants to destroy you? And it turned out that all that uh, use, that all that, gr that group by itself also was not capable of stopping an effort uh, of our foe to the east trying to annex us. So without additional aid from allies, without additional resources, that group also cannot get there. Now we're working on the third massive and the different concepts of flying around. One of them I heard is curiosity. Another is uh, new thinking, and we are sort of gently touching upon these uh, probabilities. But the problem is when you are at the lower point of these transitions and transformations, very often you get disoriented and uh, you fall into the trap of uh, being suspicious where everybody is right and nobody is right. And Alexei, I see him as a sort of censor who feels what's going on and it, he turns his uh, sen sensing into ideas and words and the best ones, they do penetrate the national discussion. And we are basically observing, my thesis is that we are observing a new cultural massive being grown and this is why we're experiencing such a neurosis, maybe even psychosis, that some to some degree in our layers of society, because what's happening behind the front lines and on the front lines? On the front lines, there is a poisoning with death. The usual topics that are usually being avoided, they they are actually brought up in your face in the front. Why do guys uh, sometimes suffer frostbites? You'd think it's pretty easy to prevent that. They just get tired when you face seven waves uh, of attackers daily that you need to kill. It's uh, depressing your psyche. And we, most of us have not been taught to work with death. Situations with uh, death poisoning you daily, most of us have not been trained to work with that. So unless you're a special uh, 
especially strong individual or actually went through some special training, you are defenseless in front of that. And behind the front lines, we have two big massives that are not really helpful. We have the third uh, thinking philosophy that is just being formed. And then uh, that is under the influence of a raging war and uh, slow poisoning and sometimes rapid poisoning with death and all that harm that is happening. And I, this is my general preset, uh, Alexei, how I wanted to describe. I, I agree with you. Very, you actually went a little deeper than I uh, wanted to post postulate in the first thesis, but I think the problem is that indeed is that the old doesn't work and new ideas when they stem, they are being marginalized immediately because uh, they're new, they're different. And majority of people, the way they operate, they operate in the systems of friend or foe. And if you do not exactly belong to friend, then you immediately become foe. And they fall during the war, during the death poisoning, during psychosis and neurosis events in the society, you become an enemy. You become a target. Yeah, and basically when we ask, when you see something unusual, we ask Americans, what, what is that unknown? Americans would say, no, we're not sure. French would also say, not exactly sure. Uh, ask other allies, they're also not sure. And then the society in Ukraine often does uh, another thing. It, it knows how to. It destroys uh, that uh, new and then gives uh, that uh, an order or heralds it as the genius. Yep, that's cultural wars. Cultural wars and information psychological operations is basically a channeling of that uh, neurosis. If you are going to be a professional in these uh, operations, I haven't done that for a while, but I've uh, talked to some people uh, and when I was interviewing possible uh, candidates for that work, I was asking them, call the target group and uh, target audience and name the target pain, the pains of your target group. Because you need to understand that uh, if you are working with psychosis, you need to know the, uh, the feel of the pain of the, that sore spot that causes it. If you are conducting an inter-information psychological operation, you need to know the weak spots. I'm meaning the ones who work against us. So they got a break where it's thin, right? Exactly. So yeah, or if he is falling, push him, right? So how do they work against us? On the outside and on the inside as well. Their process is immediately to mark somebody different with a different uh, thought as a foe, mark as foe, and eliminate as foe. And they keep pushing so the usual person would have no gap between uh, understanding foe, marking foe, and uh, action. Destroy that uh, target. And it, free person lives in that gap between the thought and the action. You need to think. So their target is to minimize that gap. So let's say proverbial Datsuk is foe, let's uh, attack him. A person becomes a ref very reflective, reflexive. Okay, <laughs> why are you interjecting? You still haven't completed the thought. But if you do want, come, come here. Yeah, sure, talk. Um, I want to show here how it works as well. I got another example. People are asking, what are the signs of information psychological warfare elements and how to neutralize that? Okay, a, a good example I have. Uh, today, there was a missile attack on Kiev. Most of them were shut down. Maybe some remnants fell on somebody, and yeah, there was a news that some people got wounded by the remnants of the missiles that fell from the sky. So mayor of Kiev comes out, Klitschko, and says that uh, we destroyed the missiles. Uh, power, our leadership comes out and says that, yeah, we repelled the attack, but there are dead and wounded because of the elements of these missiles which fell on the people. What happens after? Nothing really, right? Why nothing in terms of what happened with Alexei after his statement on the 14th? Um, nothing, because, uh, well, first of all, fewer victims, comparably. And as Serge Moscovich was saying, the dead ones, that they do affect the living uh, invisibly, but they do. So, frankly, this one... Similar situation, just fewer victims than in that other house that Alexei was talking about. And the main difference is that there is no organizational push to create a media wave 
like an Alexei case, to start to turn that situation in the direction desired by a certain power. So this is a very simple example, which looks generally just like Alexei's story on the 14th, but there is no interested party to push that. And for example, to sink Lichko, because he made a statement and uh, that is a little bit different from the current. Right, right. You're actually you're correct. There was an explosion right after his statement when he said that they shot down all the missiles and they were not all of them uh, that were shot down. There was one explosion that happened pretty much at the time of his speech. And uh, frankly, he cannot know that, for example, if uh, all the cruise missiles were shot down and then the ballistic trajectory missile comes in uh, that was shot a bit later, uh, he is not aware. And everybody's, you know, real life people, they understand he may not have full data. And this is not ordered to destroy him, so he stays alive and he works, right, uh, as a political entity. So I'll give you a sure sign that you are being led, with a, you are being manipulated by psychological law. It's the feeling when you recognize that some the speaker is using your words. It's like in the movie when the sailor is uh, confirming the political activist saying i am from a village i cannot speak that well but our commissar is expressing me through his words so here then is the time when you should be bringing it up so wait a sec you mean that popular bloggers and journalists uh they're popular because they share my i share their opinion they share mine and they say similar views so that's why right and i just click the like button so it's easy then to differentiate why popular blogger is doing that. Is he manipulating you or not? Or are you just following what you like? For example, if your blogger is Sextovich or Datsuk or somebody, uh, when there is a simple sign, when the goals declared by the blogger and the goals realized by the blogger differ, this is when he manipulates with uh, other goals. So, for example, you have a fiery blogger who is saying that it's real bad that Ukrainian military-industrial complex doesn't work. And then you follow him, you see that he actually is investigating, he is pushing, he is promoting that topic, he is fired about bringing it back up. But when you see another picture, when somebody uh, is saying that it's bad that some part of uh, our military-industrial complex is uh, not really effective, is not working, and then in some other news, or maybe just personally, you see him talking to one of the directors of the manufacturing facilities for the industrial complex. And you ask yourself, why, why is that? Why are they so peaceful? Because he should be at his uh, throat, he should be attacking him, he should be questioning his decisions and, and why they, they're not producing. So many people do not know that in politics, despite all the attacks at each other, uh, in front of the audience, they very often shake hands and uh, break bread together in the restaurant after that. And the main tool you have is to look at the fruit, at the fruit of an action. Even Christ, when he was asked, how do you define uh, if it is righteous or not, uh, he suggested to look at the fruit of that action. Because very often, even he acknowledged that it's difficult to tell at the moment what is the goal, what is the, what is the person doing right now. But by the fruit of an action, you can always tell. And that's the question one can ask. You can ask internally, when I'm listening to that fiery blogger, what is being born inside? What fruit does uh, that be bears in me? If I all of a sudden become very aggressive, if I want to attack people, if I want to strangle them, that is the fruit of the blogger you've been listening to or the channel, media channel you've been listening to. And if you look inside and you highlight other things, that you become brighter, lighter, that you want to understand people and to work with them and to build a better future, then it's probably a different situation. You are listening to something else. The main target of these psychological ops is to make sure people never look inside and that they don't analyze these uh, paths that bring them to certain fruit. And when hatred grows inside, it's easier to take the person and just drag them step by step through your psychological op using that hatred, for example. And 
we can do a little experiment here later. Um, but let's interrupt. Let, let me interrupt you, uh, Alexei. I want to continue another thought. I want to remind that uh, IPSO is Information Psychological Special Op. For those people who don't know what it is, they are different in methods. How do you recognize that at some point you are not a victim of manipulation, but that you are present at a thinking process rather than manipulation? It's rather simple, actually. When you hear questions that are uncomfortable, especially when you hear a question that you're almost ready to kill somebody for because that question really discombobulates you. It's difficult to think of such questions. It's difficult to ask such questions. Trust me, as a person who specializing in these questions, it is not easy to come up with a question that will really disturb your opponent. So, speaking of fruit, there is a thing called indoctrination. It's non-critical acceptance of any doctrine, any doctrine really, that has a life view level explaining how does the world go around, where did it start, what's the sense, and all these happen things happening. So doctrines of that level, right, without critical thinking. In any indoctrination, there are questions that are forbidden to ask. Nobody actually forbids you to do that, but they answer you that these questions are pointless. This question should not be asked like that. It is wrong. It is a wrong question. This question is uh, inappropriate. So there are a lot of descriptions and definitions why these questions should not be asked. Oh, yeah, you'll learn when you grow, right? Pay attention. So in any doctrine, there are forbidden questions. And now an example. Alexei remembered Christ. Christ was asked a question that he avoided answering when he was asked. He answered in a different place. Uh, when the when, what's the question? Do you remember? Money and no, the other one. Oh, what's the truth? Yes, that one. In the other place, he answered that I am the path and true life. But could he answer that to Pontius Pilate? No, he couldn't, because when questioned. He could not have answered to Pontius Pilate that answer. He could not answer that question to him because he Pontius was not indoctrinated. You cannot provide indoctrinated answer to a non-indoctrinated person. This is the water divide for all Christians. For all Christians, Christ is the only way and uh, the only path. For everybody else who are outside Christianity, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, but he wanted to also show that it is not what, but who is a, is a truth, is a true path in this case. Right. But that's a great example. Sergei Arkadyevich gave a beautiful example here, how it works in Ukraine. And the first time you ask a, a forbidden question, you know, in our society, they look at you saying, dude, you're kind of wrong, but what a question are you asking? Second time you ask that, you get noticed and uh, you'll get an answer saying you do you realize what you're asking you're attacking the holy stuff this question is inappropriate and the third time you ask that they mark you as a foe as an enemy because you keep asking these questions and then they just push you out remember the inhabited island and uh, when the uh, guy gets uh, arrested and being interrogated uh, how come why are you still alive You've been shot six times and you're still breathing. And then he started asking them questions in return. And his interrogators were ready to shoot him immediately at the spot. And only the smart people like doctor and a couple others who were actually saying, no, 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 it's good that he's asking that. So that's a, another bright example of uh, that. There are always people who recognize the value of these questions, but they're always in the minority. Um, and how does indoctrination work uh, there is a group that says hey these questions that they ask in alpha and omega they're anti-ukrainian 
They are talking to... They are asking questions that are not comfortable. Daniel Yanevsky, Yaroslav Gritsak. Um, I want to chime in here. So they basically they're basically trying to point to a group of people that these ones that we are criticizing uh, that uh, practice different ideology, uh, they belong to a different group. They're not uh, of your big group, and that's their main message. They assign them to a different group that is uh, not prominent in the society, and they point finger at them. And likely, what we're saying now, neither ones nor the others will understand. Uh, very small groups will actually feel and understand and grasp the full thing. Right, because we're discussing matters that are not in the right uh, massive yet, not in the right value uh, massive. There will be one, there will be growth, there will be a time and place where these questions will be accepted. I have a question, civilization of curiosity, is it a good place for that? I think so, yes, that would be a wonderful development. I want to bring another example here. Uh, Boris Akunin, uh, Georgi Chertishvili, his real name, he's a writer. He was a Japanese right? so a very prominent writer. And he uh, told a story that when he was young, he was communicating with the officer or colonel from KGB, who finally had a conversation with him about it. My opponent didn't use the word empire, he used the word state. And I actually inserted that conversation in one of the novels later. What is our country? Historically, actually, factually, we are a state. The mission of a state is to gather peoples around us, to feed them, not to suck their blood, but to feed them with our resources. For hundreds of years uh, before us and for f half a century now, we've been uh, without sacrifice, uh, without any end to sacrifice, we're uh, aggregating people around us. Orthodoxy, empire, communism, it doesn't, it's just a matter of changing the central core, but central idea, but the concept in general was the same. So upon listening to the end of it speech, I asked a question, why? And he didn't understand, what do you mean why? So I asked him, why was the effort to build a third Rome, as you said? And his answer was, if I have to explain to you, that means I was wrong about you. And since that, we never talked. So basically, you pose the question that is forbidden. Yep, you need to understand, you shouldn't have asked the question. Nikolai, you know that uh, what you read about that uh, speech by a KGB officer about 30 minutes ago, I was walking with uh, my daughter, Aylita. For those who don't know, I was walking with her in the street and she asks me, why Russians are so aggressive? What's the reason behind that? Where does that start? And I tell her that, look, many parents regularly hit their kids. And why do they do that? They usually do that when they cannot find a proper argument or convince their child that this behavior is uh, the right one to choose. And these uh, patterns of behavior, they're very well, they're very pervasive in Russia. So basically, what he is saying that KGB officer, that the core enforcement idea has to be there. And Akunin asked the right question, why? And my daughter asked me the same question, why? Why do they always do it through force? Why do you need to make a super effort? I'm developing the thought here, right, with expansion and all that when on the level of family, you just don't uh, find right arguments to convince your wife. We, uh, for example, because in Russia, there is also a lot of uh, family violence happening. They actually recently lifted, uh, alleviated some of the punishment for the family violence. There was time when they, they, it became harder, but recently they, uh, again, a couple of years ago, I think, uh, turned that situation differently and the punishment is now marginal. In their culture, they do have a very strong element of violence, which probably stems from inability to explain why are you doing one or the other action. 
that is not finding an appeal with the world, with your neighbors, with uh, other members of society. And then the only route you, they have is to enforce it by doctrine, to enforce it by force. We are expanding because we have the right. Why do you have the right? Well, because we're strong and we that's how we develop. That's how we self-aggrandize uh, ourselves. And I'm answering to my daughter that, look, I think it's because they don't have enough love in the bigger scheme. Why are they always uh, expanding? Why are they always attacking? It is lack of love. It is looking for attention from the world, seeking, hey, we can do things. Yeah, we may stink, we may suck in education and some other atrocities that we do, but you have to love us. You have to acknowledge us to respect and love us. In the normal society, violence is being avoided because if the society is built on love or understanding, there is no, it's the understanding is there is no need to for violence. That harmony and love uh, are much more important. That's when the society develops more harmoniously in the right direction. And this, I think, is very important to understand for us because uh, since we will have to have relations with Russia for a long time. I don't know when we'll be able to fully resolve that, but we'll be forced to keep solving it in the decades to come. They do, we need to understand that they do want love and attention, but they do want it through that prism of broken psyche, uh, broken by Tsarist empire, by the communists, by all that traumatic experience. And they cannot leave that cursed circle, cursed cycle. I have a big story of a discussion with Oleg Bakhtiyarov, who was building a concept of civilization of will or freedom. And the basic principle of that was no preset borders for that freedom and that will, because it uh, considers that next to that will, there is always thinking, empathy, analysis, feelings. He, they, and when we talked about the child, you need to understand that you don't have to always convince the child. And there are kids like that, that you cannot convince. They have very strong will. Tens of times I ran into the ones. You can always find agreement with them. With the really strong-willed people, you can find an agreement. Why? Because if their will is strong, they do understand that besides your will, there is a will of other people. And with that other will, you can come to an agreement. In essence, that it does not become defining, but uh, in understanding that besides your will, there is a will of other people around you. The problem is when you do not want to have other to give other people their chance to use their will when you just uh, want to have your own in your world when you don't care about others but that doesn't work the will only works when there is thinking when there is faith there is empathy then the will really functions because when you take these sources out of it 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 fades it disappears. Also, the will uh, has a good chance uh, to find agreement with other people's wills. So it's from that standpoint, it's a very interesting phenomenon. Because when there is no will, you cannot, uh, you do not have enough energy. And then nothing works, really. Uh, when you're young, you have enough energy to override anything. But as you get older and you don't have answers to the question why, you fade to exist. The will is often a defining structure, but it gets weaker as we get older. and in order to sustain itself into 
the dawn days of life one needs to have thinking to have empathy to have all these things supporting it in order to continue living i actually wrote I wrote a uh, work together with Oleg Bakhtiarov, and I think this is something that differs us from Russia. Because in Ukraine we do have will, but we have will and freedoms, and it all stems from the same root will uh, in Ukrainian vola and volnosti means uh, have the same root which basically is will and freedom. So it does uh, include the acceptance of other people's wills in, in that. All right, now let me take over. Uh, Alexei, the second sign I want to address about you being a part of uh, PSYOP is that when you're being cut off from asking questions. When somebody wrote a post on Facebook and then uh, you come there asking questions, you're being told, hey, we'll ban you if you continue asking these questions. So then it's a sign for you. This is not a sign. Uh, th this is not a, a fiery heart of a blogger. This is a psyop. Now let's answer the question, what is a Western society? Back when uh, Greece won the battle at marathon with persia it's uh it wasn't equivalent as if russia attacked moldova today and moldova would have won there are a lot of legends around it there was a very strong pro-persian party in athens and on the grave of their dead soldiers they uh, were saying fiery speeches and one of the great ones that is basically a piece of uh, theory of democracy that is uh, now a founding stone of that. So he's describing and he's talking to his people. He's uh, saying that Persia is a great country. They have a great education system from uh, the lower to the higher levels of society. Even Socrates uh, con confirms that uh, that's a great system and uh, Persia is a very advanced country. And they were aggregating skills and knowledge from both uh, South uh, Asia and West and everywhere. So, but he still uh, states that we won because for one single main reason, their system works on the will of one person. So on the one hand, it's great. They do have a great vertical elevator. You can be a slave and then you can become a uh, higher ranking person in the society, but it still follows the will of one person at the top. And our society is built on artificially constructed ongoing set of internal conflicts. And as I'm talking to you now, for example, there is a pro-Persian party here in Athens, and we cannot forbid them or cancel them out of existence. We need to talk, discuss, and win in a fair discussion. So you cannot comment a ZERP. You basically have to negotiate and talk. We built a civilization where you can be asked any uncomfortable question. And that is your strength when you can also ask these questions and answer these questions. And if you, your opponents, let's say pro-Persian party, asked you a question and you have no way to answer it, then you're weaker. And they're saying that it's easier it's it's actually better to lose uh, a battle to Persia, but still re retain the character of your civilization than to win and become one like Persia. Uh, there have been also, of course, a lot of times in Greece where the oligarchs were ruling and uh, they became a bit despotic, but that specific segment was amazing. Oh, yeah, yeah, Alexei, they actually grew into philosophy from sophistry and uh, earlier known sophists yeah yeah basically they basically announced uh, sophists to be um, psyops and they went to other philo uh, version of philosophy okay let me finish let me finish here 
So the strength of the West is in that it is based on answering questions. And the questions have to be discussed, have to be answered. This is a group of bunch uh, different discussions. And back in Greece, everybody knew, everybody trained, uh, was trained how to speak. So it was not easy back then, but that's the root of that civilization. And the third sign of uh, PSYOP comes from that, that everything is black and white, that you don't ask questions, you don't, uh, there is no gray area. You are either with us or against us. And that's what they're using, they were using against uh, me and in these re recent attacks. All these discussions about Aristovich that were up, uh, bubbled in the media, they definitely follow that third protocol that there is bad and good. And the goal of PSYOP is to make you dumber. So if you continue feeling, for example, yourself always right, let's use uh, sophistry here in the light of psychology. If you are right, if you understand that you are right, it's a very weak philosophic position. It's dangerous to be right because that weakens your thinking. It's much more uh, advantageous to continuously place yourself in situations when you think you may be wrong, where you need to answer others' questions and also answer your own internal questions. And there is an internal mechanism that is kind of cunning that people are trained to get, to use and uh, it sort of uh, provides a screen, a veneer that they are asking questions. But these questions are domesticated, they're mild questions. And you're sort of asking yourself, but uh, you're not. Uh, actually, yeah, Alexei, I'll catch up here. Uh, Descartes, uh, back in the days, uh, also, it, it's Cartesian uh, doubt that he brought back into philosophy, that uh, the doubt itself is not the, the value. The, what he brings is that uh, it sort of allows the questions to the founding stones, to the founding essence of an opinion. And even uh, that was uh, sort of a weakening in the bigger f uh, philosophy front. It's it's uh, it basically allowed people to be concerned about some things, but then not ask questions and come back to the usual. So exactly in this light, we are not interested in philosophy of war. We're interested in the sophistics uh, of that, where different opinions, where questions are uncomfortable and answers are only temporary and they need to be rethought later and and the third yeah is basically needs to be a continuous struggle a continuous uh, fight and the third sign of uh, psyop is that you have no doubts that nothing is uh, doubtful that you're very straightforward that, yeah, there may be some nuance, like where did the missile come? Did they take money or not? Did, was the solar taken or not? I'm just bringing the recent examples. But there is no doubt the event happened, and it happened in the way I was told. So that's a definite sign that you're part of a PSYOP or being affected by it. All right. Um, Alexei was great in unfolding this topic. The only... Uh, Note that the uh, marathon battle happened not in 1400 uh, BC, but uh, at 400 BC. Um, oh yeah, sorry, I misspoke. So should we should we instill uh, such a an example of uh, questions? Should we instill that we do not need to so that we do not need pluralism of voices during times of war? That we need to include some censorship? I think Alexei brought a great example from the ancient times that uh, we actually do need uh, pluralism. We do need different voices. We do need different questions. And I think what uh, happens is that uh, when our country dives deep into that uh, TV marathon, government sponsored one opinion stuff, it uh, causes these events uh, like what unfolded with Alexei. Um, because one of his main attacks were attackers were quoting Russian channels, were saying basically, look, Russian channels are quoting Alexei, he's popular there. So the group that uh, 
Poroshenko and other uh, people who include, were included in that team of uh, Takar Istovich, they essentially uh, indicated that they're part of internal agenda um, within Russia. Because when they're relying on Russian media, they are highlighting that they have no answers to these questions or not, not even questions in Ukrainian space. But uh, they're rather bringing questions and uh, standard uh, viewpoints from Russia. Well, yeah, that they don't have information there. Exactly. Russian media doesn't have information. Like, for example, I was called today from France. They were viewing some clips that uh, Ukraine uh, military are hunting people to draft to the army. So they are view viewing our videos from Telegram, from some other channels and some YouTube channels and some alternative media, but not in mainstream. And they're viewing them in France, uh, being concerned and uh, asking questions. And I uh, think we should be answering to that in the way that, yes, there is a reality like, that, that's definitely ha happening. It's uh, we are getting ready to a big wave of offensive from Russian side. And yes, there is mobilization effort going underway. But then there is a PSYOP company from Russians who are playing actively, not just here. For example, today, Sabchak on her Telegram channel posted a video, uh, a piece of uh, Skabiev or Solyova, where they were discussing that logic of Ukrainian mobilization. Why? So that people who are viewing them, they would start using all these PSYOP ideas and descriptors from Russia to play and use and talk about them here. And the logic is basic. It is uh, designed to quarrel us against each other and to break that monolith uh, will to resist the invader as it uh, was at the beginning of war. And they want to break us internally and turn us into 1918 so that Pitlura would be fighting uh, Skarpatsky and Makhno was fighting uh, the Reds and Pitlura. Basically, everyone versus everyone, while the Bolsheviks and the commies were advancing from the east and essentially killing everybody who is not with them or would refuse to join them. So I think we need to keep this... Uh, Ukrainian media open. We need to push the point that uh, society needs to understand why things are happening, why there are some excesses going on, why there are issues, and why they're happening right now. And I'm sure if we started talking about these problems earlier than these corruption scandals and nothing that bubbles up, that would have been bubbled up sooner, and we probably uh, would have resolved them sooner and uh, be in a better place already. So answering the question from our viewers, no, absolutely no to censorship. Yes, you can perhaps uh, put uh, some technical quiet uh, notes on do not disclose positions of our air defense uh, artillery and uh, while the operation is unfolding, do not uh, talk about the details of what and how. But in general, the societal questions or bigger things not related to the immediate warfare, they should be discussed openly. Another Another question that people were asked, how do we pull people out of the PSYOP? How do we, how do we bring them back from the toxic reality? It's probably a question to me, I'll take that. The same way, as always, how do you pull somebody from being indoctrinated from his or her doctrine? Of course, with questions. If the situation were too far, then uh, Last century, uh, a fellow named Hubbard in the United States actually suggested uh, to use detox. And it was uh, understood in a wider sense, not as in uh, just physi physiological detoxication, but also detoxifying the whole environment around you. And that only happens if a person still has uh, internal desire to seek for truth and to seek for meanings. If that is still alive within him or her, there is hope. 
if that is has faded, there is nothing you can do. Uh, and then he addressed the questions that are prohibited in the doctrine. So are there other ideals? Are there other doctrines? That's one of the questions. Are these, uh, is your doctrine, can it be thought about? Or the uh, idea of a doctrine is valid only within a doctrine? What is the price of a doctrine? Very few doctrines discuss the price of it. Some of them do. Like in Christian and Christianity, they do say that, okay, you can get to the God's kingdom, but uh, this is the price you have to pay. In Marxism, there is no price for that. It is forbidden to be discussed. Yeah, because uh, what's what's the cost? It's uh, Stalin's gulags, it's murder of millions, it's uh, poverty on mass scale. So this question is for, uh, forbidden from being uh, asked. In most doctrines, this question about price and cost is not allowed. Then the question of relating the doctrine with other ideals. So, for example, a God of Christians and a God of Muslims, is it the same God? And doctrines usually wiggle as uh, eels in the frying pan trying to evade uh, that question. Be and yeah, be right, because there are a lot of too many uncomfortable answers. So there is always a limit to a doctrine that are not usually discussed. Basically, what is beyond these uh, borders of your doctrine? Just like in philosophy, what is in nothing? Oh, nothingness is nothingness. No, what do you mean? It's like, is it a third state? No, the question doesn't have any sense. This question doesn't have any sense because... No, 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 it does, because you're inside the being. And if you expand yourself to beyond the being here uh, in physical body, it does make sense. And then they try evading that. So you, you basically probe the borders. And people who live within doctrines, yeah, very often they enjoy them because they like them. And Heraclitus uh, tried to turn it back to Sufism at some point, but unfortunately he failed and philosophy took over instead. All right. Let me talk about the practical side of it. If, if Imagine if a human is a hardware, right? So if you take a usual physical hard drive, you can override data many times, right? It does not change the hard drive. Kind of does, but very slightly. Human, unlike that, is actually a biological creature. So just learning new things changes you. A condition that you experience, a faith, a knowledge, it is supported by hormonal state. Exactly. So biochemistry of brain and hormonal, that's what I'm talking about. Exactly. Um, so the person who started to believe something, he becomes biologically different. And when you attack their positions, they actually feel it on the physical level that you are attacking their uh, core of their beingness, even on the level of uh, smells that you do, so, you know, that word that you smell different, that thing. So this is a very dangerous uh, activity, especially if the person is sitting on a very fat and, uh, you know, established doctrine. So, and, and yeah, people are uh, kind of saying that, uh, yeah, it's very, it's deadly dangerous to get people out of doctrines. Right. So how do you get them out of this? A, first of all, understand that this is a very dangerous activity. And B, find, uh, how do you take them out? Find the weak spots that he cannot look at and the ones that he, that he get bothered with. And then compare these pain points with his doctrine. And then... Just call on him or her to answer within themselves why your doctrine doesn't help to solve these matters within yourself that bother you. This is a special trick. It's like you're sticking a finger in a crack and uh, slowly pushing it deeper and wider. So that's a other tricky way to do that. I know there is a legend. It's wise from all sides. It's an old... Uh, legend I want to share. So it's about Tao. It's like Chinese uh, concept of uh, that the world is penetrated uh, around by the invisible force, kind of like Star Wars, that there is energy, there is force around you. 
Well, well, it's uh, Alexei. It's actually the Dao is about the path it had to be. Right, but I'm just simplifying it. So the legend says there was a remote mountainous area, and uh, in China they do have belief that there are kitsune, the foxes that uh, pretend to be beautiful girls, and they live with men. They hypnotize them, indoctrinate them, basically, and that's how they live. After they lose one, they get another one, and they're eternal. They don't die. So. And one uh, elderly couple, they both were 50s, uh, 50 plus. The husband started to think where to find a younger wife because, you know, a harsh climate, working in the field. So one of these foxes understood that situation. And on the way where his wife was walking, she pretended to be a nice girl sitting by the boiling water, a uh, big uh, jar of boiling water. And uh, his wife asked, oh, what are you doing here? You're naked, beautiful, and with that uh, boiling stuff, what are you doing here? And she said, uh, oh, one magician told me that uh, to gather certain herbs, and I just, um, I was 50 plus, and I dove in that uh, big jar, and but it's boiling. Oh, yeah, but it, it somehow magically turned me into a youth. And uh, the elderly lady uh, asked her, could I jump into the jar? And she said, yeah, sure, but uh, go ahead. So she jumps and boils. And uh, that fox turns into his wife, visually, and uh, the, she goes back to the husband of that lady and tells the story, basically tells that story to him that, oh, am I amazing, I met somebody naked uh, by the bubbling water, she told me I can get uh, young as well as she was, and I jumped and turned, so. And she goes back and uh, she hypnotizes the man, so he fully believes he's happy, and uh, thinks his kids are good, his wife is good. Of course, it's a psyop, nothing is uh, what it seems, but he doesn't care. So one day, a Tao practitioner walks by a village and uh, understands everything. Uh, when he was invited to dinner to that house, he actually calls the guy to the side and asks him, hey, do you even realize whom you're living with? And the guy said, uh, do I need to know? Do I need to know your answer? And this is how it works. The fourth sign of Sayop is uh, your own concession of refusal to even understand that you're part of a Sayop. person says that it's good for me. It means that uh, people were very well uh, processed on the indoctrination level. And there are a lot of people around who are on that level who don't want to know the truth. Uh, let's look at that from the Russian standpoint and their goals. Oh, yeah, yeah, you can look at their uh, pinch points and their painful points, and that will give you uh, an understanding. All right, so let's not think as uh, Russians as monolith, but as groups and cultural massives. So we can trace that those people who had more or less liberal mindset, they were allowed to leave. So generally if there will be a huge catastrophe in russia they do have this potential intelligence and uh, elites and monetary potential those people who actually had resources and who are bright enough they left so they can possibly come back uh who i'm analyzing that what happened in ukraine who left those people who who is that monaco battalion are those people who fled ukraine are they the best of us if if there is a catastrophe of you, if happening in Ukraine, is it the best representatives of us that are outside? Um, first answer is a lot of kids left, women and children left. But do you think the kids who were emigrated, who were uh, who left the country as refugees and they're being integrated in the societies of other countries? Do you think they'll remain Ukrainian culture? Do you think they'll come back? I don't know. That's a painful question for me. Because when I see this commentary from the front, how people are proud about uh, good people, uh, very well-known, important people dying on the front, then I, uh, the question tortures me. Was it smart to let cream de la cream to go to the front and die? It kind of reminiscent of the Soviet times when everybody were proud to be part of a system and to go and die uh, on the big uh, war with uh, Germany. But the best of them were kept by the system and they were told 
to not go, that they are very important behind uh, in the production lines. They shouldn't be risking their lives in the front. Do you know, um, there's another good angle I want to address here. The best armies in the world, where do they have the best officers? In the best armies, the, the best ones are in the training facilities. They are the ones training the future army. The second best are in the front commanding. So it's an easy question to ask and get the answer. Because in Ukraine, if you look at our front, where, do, where are the best of ours? They're not in the training facilities. They are actually the ones preferring to go and fight. And uh, the societal question is, uh, pressure is, uh, after the war, when you'll be asked, what, what were you doing? You'll say, oh, you've been training. You're not fighting. So there, there's a pressure for the best to be there and risk their lives. And the society is not getting that point that the best need to be better. The best need to be training the ones who are just joining the front. They need to be in the training facilities. And that's that uh, in the best armies from Roman times, it started like that. And in the Roman times, the in the training facilities, they had heavier armor, heavier weapons. They were really training them. They had great uh, trainers. So in our case, it's a little different. It's, uh, yeah, the best ones do want to fight. So if to go back to Russia, look at their goals. They understand they cannot win. They wanted to. The return of Gerasimov and Lapin on month uh, 11 of this war, there was a miracle and Putin started listening to his military. And Putin's military are telling that well, there is no way we can uh, find a solution to your tasks. In Russia, it was always uh, an issue. Politicians were always uh, setting tasks and the bar too high, so the military cannot often solve them. Remember um, two speeches of Putin. One that he said we started to uh, this war to defend Lugansk and Donetsk republics. And uh, just a couple of days ago, he gave another speech saying that we started this war to get rid of the threats from the neighbor territories. And in this case, is there a certain measure? How do you define that you remove the threat? If so you can announce the war is over anytime. Uh, yeah, and Alexei, I want to uh, elaborate on that as well. Go ahead, Sergey. The getting rid of a threat from their point of view can be different. You can either destroy the possible foe on our side, or you can just destroy everything on this territory, and then there is no risk. There is no need to for anybody to take that. So, another thing that I want to add here is that. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Nikolai. Um, they do try to differentiate that there is no threat to destruction of Russia. So their attack is uh, that there was a threat to destroy Russia, to destruction of Russia. I want to say that us liberating Donetsk and, Donba, Donetsk and Lugansk or to even taking Crimea back, this is not a threat to destroy Russia. They've existed without them for a while. So there is no real threat to destruction. Yeah, but we're not talking about the destruction threat. Where I'm taking you guys is um, they don't, they switch their rhetoric, Putin switched his rhetoric to not uh, adhere to analytical tasks. They're declaring uh, getting rid of threats. Threats are not quantifiable number. So, the, and their goal right now is of their PSYOP is to put us at the negotiation table. So they need to overemphasize, exaggerate their advances on the battlefield. And they get to certain uh, territories they can capture and say, well, do you want to fight more? We'll continue. Or maybe we should sit down. So that's uh, number one. And they need to scare the West with the perspective of the expansion of this conflict. That's why the nuclear rhetoric is back. And the other thing internally inside Ukraine, they need to solve another task. They need to get rid of people who can point finger and say, this is a bluff. This is Russian side doing a PSYOP on you. They need to create conditions when the West is diminishing their support to Ukraine. And let's analyze what's 
the main condition that the West uh, will follow to reduce their support to Ukraine. Oh yeah, it's a uh, lack of trust in Ukraine. Bingo. So the moment you start bringing, you see the Russian side uh, attacking and capitalizing on this message that Ukraine is a corrupt country. Ukraine cannot succeed. Ukraine uh, is wasting your weapons and money. And behind that is uh, sort of like the mid uh, 20th century statement that, look, Ukrainians are genetically not capable of having their own country. They're not a uh, real state. They will never be. They, they genetically are not uh, advanced enough. And they're actually trying to prove to the West that this is a war between two barbarians. They're not even trying to be not barbaric themselves. They're saying, no, 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 it's, it's uh, just a fight of one cannibal with another cannibal. So don't even get in that. You don't need that. We, we figure it out. It's our imperial internal struggle. This is the goal of their side. And where do they hit? Let's name our wounds. What does the usual Ukrainian believe in? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, we'll believe in victory. No, no, no. I uh, mean, Nikolai, in regards to wounds, right? What are the weak points? We do expect uh, traitors to be am among us, right? So that's part of us. We can be triple educated, can be an academician and uh, with Western education and stuff, but they are always prone to believing there is a traitor. And then how is it done with the PSYOP? Let's, oh, Filman. There are great Aristovich, Romanenko, and Datsyuk. And then somehow there is a traitor Feldman among them. I'm just giving you a quick example. The most important discussion is on Friday. Feldman always disappears. Why does he disappear? Oh, there is a real explanation, but I'm not going to give it to you now. Yeah, yeah, I'm just giving an example. He's disappearing because he he is a traitor. He doesn't. He wants to avoid the most important discussions. He sort of supports the others, but on Fridays he doesn't. And then the next main uh, sore besides the traitor. What else do we have? Ukrainians? I'm at a loss. Oh yeah, we have our our power is bad. The leadership is horrible, right? So let's uh, ex extrapolate on that. Whom is uh, Feldman a friend of? Oh, Feldman is a friend of Aristovich, right? And Aristovich was uh, an advisor to the office of the president. So Feldman has access to the office of the president and he's managing certain things and he's influencing certain things there. It's just two-step logic, right? So let's collaborate that. And then the external management, is it another sore point? Yeah, it kind of is. It kind of is. I think Ukrainians do not, like I said, I think uh, external management doesn't worry Ukrainians. I can even try to prove it to you. No, 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 no. Wait. Here's a question. Does Soros want to sell Ukraine? I don't think Ukrainians want or, or worry about that. But I have a question. Okay, who takes, uh, who sells the forest from Karpati? Forests. Who sells timber? Oh, crap. Okay. So it's um, maybe Medvedchuk, maybe somebody. Yeah, there we go. So there's always a, an understanding that some external powers are trying to divide and conquer Ukraine. Not that we are friends with the United States or Europe, but in the sense that they all want to split us and divide us and uh, eat us apart. And the message in this case would be, see, you're getting weapons, you're getting support by the West. Maybe you even win this war, but for centuries forward, you will be paying for these arms and this support. If this wouldn't work, they wouldn't be hitting it continuously. And PSYOP is always measuring these uh, things. And the fourth one is the usual question. So what, are you the smartest one? That, that's you. Is he the smartest one? How does he allow himself uh, to say these things to all of us? He probably believes that he is the smartest. Why? He shouldn't be the smartest. And why can't you, one, the question is, why can't you build a house in the village one uh, meter taller than every other house? Let's answer that. So you don't stick out? Yeah, so you don't stick out. 
So it shouldn't have more than the others? No, no, no. That's an old story. That's a pre-Soviet Union story. It's an old story. It's an old anecdote. And it sounds like uh, two guys are meeting in the village and one is asking another, hey, there are people are saying that your daughter is a whore. Oh, what do you mean? I got three sons, I have no daughter. I don't know, but I already told the whole village. Now you got to deal with that, with your daughter. Uh, yeah. So why does that work? Yeah, it, it goes back to another one. Why is it important that your neighbor's cow should have died? Yeah, well, there probably are these interesting cultural layers. But if we don't understand the goals, Alexei, of other people who are against us, and at least formally trying to address them, how can we find an antidote, right? Do you know one of the things they post on a tactical level, the Russian side up on a tactical side? They infiltrate uh, rumors of a certain kind. For example, there is that brigade that is heroically fighting here, but over there, to the right, there is another brigade that's fighting just as heroically as you are. But you know they're getting paid better and they're getting a little more ammo and they're getting better equipment. And also they've been sent on rotation two days before you. And part of them will go study to Britain, but you won't. And then and then that starts uh, that internal squabble like, hey, maybe we just, uh, you know, withdraw a little bit. And if these guys are too tough, let them fend. Why? Why is that happening? For example, Nikolai, do you have uh, issues with the two getting more money than you do? See, that's an important question. There could be a whole other discussion about that. Why do you, and how do you feel about other people being good and being uh, earning and being better off in life? Guys, I think this, these are also another angle to that because we're analyzing the actual facts now. We can also analyze the myths that are, permeate and one of the myths is uh, basically goes as that we are one of the last humans that have human DNA because we're not uh, reptiloids and we didn't let them run our country much and if you go into that rabbit hole this is a death of your mind because you, there is no way you can uh, neither confirm nor deny right that's uh, yeah, the earth is flat, that story. According to the, uh, guys, a curious thing. Um, according to the polling, 46% of United States citizens believe that their country is controlled, their leadership is controlled by some external powers. And we don't go into details. In the aliens, reptiloids, others, some international monetary clubs and all. But and this is the society where you could speak about any topics uh, under any uh, pretense. Kanye West, uh, I think, praised uh, or said that Hitler did something good recently. So, you know, uh, and even with all that expertise, with all the education, with all the civilization, it seems to be a humankind problem to believe into these weird things. And this resentment also shows up with the nations which have been suppressed for a long time, which have been under occupation for a long time. It's very prominent there. Oh, it's simple. Uh, in Ukraine, people are watching their neighbors not to obtain additional evolutionary advantages. And the moment they find these advantages, they add them to the list of traders. Because that uh, management and the whole history of Ukraine, Poles, uh, uh, Russians, Turks, uh, whoever was part of that, this always was a big threat to a certain community, to a certain household, because if their neighbor has sold, let's say, to Poles or to somebody, uh, they are part of a list that gets support and you are not. So he is getting advantages, your neighbor is getting advantages and you are not. This is why on the cultural level it is sort of built into that uh, concept that weird tribalism is built in uh, survival of small groups. Uh, to watch your neighbor, did they get any advantages or not uh, externally? And any attempt by your neighbors to obtain these advantages are treated as treason. And 
it's, it was easy. You could go to Russians, go to Poles, go to Turks and get those advantages. And our neighbors, of course, know that. And of course, they've been using that just to split us if they needed to. I want uh, Alexei to draw our discussion back to Russians, though, to our current foe. Because right, right now it's probably the most pressing. And I want to bring it in the light of electing election campaign and government, because if you are taking uh, any position in the government, you are really uh, attacked from all sides, right? You have to take some position and you're being attacked. By the way, where did uh, a year ago he disappeared? We uh, lost all the internet, so this is not a stream now. This is a recording. People will be watching this uh, stream as a recording. All right, <laughs> he's uh, virtually with us, exactly. So, okay, back to that. When we are uh, holding a position in the government, we have to withstand all of the information attacks, uh, withstand uh, bickering from within the party, with our own lines. Usually it's informational attacks, right? Rarely it goes into the physical. But your enemies always have certain targets, certain goals that they attack on your position. And if we are saying that Russians, uh, so-called different Kremlin towers, have different targets. So we need at least to list formally the targets. What are they attacking to understand what goal are they reaching with a certain attack? Because uh, they're not declaring it uh, up front, right? They're not uh, stating we'll uh, work with that chronic pain of Ukrainians uh, by this attack. They're just doing it and we are uh, experiencing the effects. So I outlined a couple of major ones. The first one is to make sure people hate each other as enemies. In here? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Understandable. Uh, right. So the goal is to reach the mistrust between different groups. And if in the inflammation of that mistrust will start killing each other, that will be their uh, goal achieved moment. And the main task is what I said, to show Ukrainians that some of them are getting evolutionary advantages inappropriately by uh, being corrupt, by avoiding troubles that other Ukrainians suffer, by other uh, mechanisms. That house in Ternopol, Yuri talked a lot about that a lot. There was a house in Ternopol that never got their light turned off. And people were writing notes locally to the administration that if, our, if we are sitting without light, then this house needs to be turned off. So they, they they turned this off, but the house was on the line from on the line with the heating station. So when the house lost power, the whole city the town stayed without heat. Um, so they started complaining again. At the end, they got a third solution when they uh, figured how to turn this house off. But uh, they, that also turned off a lot of stores in the area. So the locals they still preferred this house to be one of the others and without power when everybody doesn't have it. Uh, even in despite the, even despite that they will not be able to reach uh, to get the stores working and they have to travel further out for products, they they were okay with that. So this is the problem. They uh, always internally they understand uh, our citizens understand that they are watch need to watch their neighbors to not get evolutionary advantages. While uh, when we talk about politics and politicians, of course they know that they need to get additional advantages to work to get their. Uh, agenda to move to do projects in Ukraine so they always naturally worked with foreign uh, and outside factors right but on the lower level people always consider that to be treason so here is your duality here's the problem but at the same time different politicians created different structures in the society different groupings so there are people who are always upset with the current politician and they always uh, were looking for a way to get away from that power and how would they do that they would have to go out and uh, they were always russians on the east saying well come here we got a czar if you complain to a czar a czar may come and help you or turks uh, offered some advantages or poles did and uh, that was always a way uh, uh, an intricate way of uh, different systems working with and against each other. And that main thought to make sure that uh, the neighbor's cow should die, that he shouldn't get the uh, evolutionary advantage. Let's take our folklore about ourselves. When the God said, uh, I'll do anything that you want, that you wish, it just your neighbor will get twice as much. And then the peasant scratched his head and said, I want my cow to die. 
Right. Yeah, exactly. So this is the wound they are abusing purposely. They know it is a weak point in our society and they want to make us uh, hate each other internally. Uh, at the maximum, that would be the civil war, right? So that's uh, the first target besides hatred and mistrust, right? Uh, what, what else? What, what is target number two? First target is hatred and mistrust. So second task i think their task the main task is for us to lose the war or at least to not win the war and they approach that from the angle that a it is impossible to win over russia militarily they're highlighting the costs how much we have lost defending solidar and they still took solidar and the west is supplying you but not enough and russia has unlimited resources and I've seen the videos, yeah, they're showing the cemeteries with the Ukrainian flags and they're screaming that Zelensky stopped that bloodshed. Russia is uh, undefeatable. Stop losing your people and you must believe us. And the second moment is, okay, let's, uh, and that's targeted at a different uh, group. Imagine you win. What will be the cost? You'll be paying for that for generations. You'll give your rivers, your forests, your earth, your land to uh, your neighbors who are supporting you. And then, yeah, another angle of that would be, okay, you, you imagine you win over Russia. What would you see as a result of that? If Russia falls apart, are you ready to deal with 20 different Russias, with 20 small Russias if they fall apart? No, 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 we don't care about that. We'll create a fence and don't even care about them, what left there. And no, it will be more expensive for you if Russia falls apart, dear Ukrainians. That's another message because uh, you'll have to deal with warring states on the east. Well, you'll have to deal with burying uh, nuclear weapons and the uh, waste from them. So it'll be more expensive for you to have uh, that kind of Russia on the other side. It is better for you if Russia stays strong. So that's another sailing point. And right now we are currently concentrated on the winning side. So here's here's an interesting thing that uh, we we still don't have a picture for the world what will happen to Russia to the defeated Russia how would that be managed. In our discussion, it doesn't. it's not present right now. It's probably a separate show in our official societal discussion. We only talk about victory. And, and I, I was thinking, talk about that or not, that's a long conversation because, uh, yeah, it's a question about reparations, about maintenance and all that. How much will the post-war world cost to the world and allies? All right. Uh, so going back to that uh, topic, what they're attacking is that Ukraine is not uh, capable of having its own country. Is there something else? So, okay, let's take that. Uh, this war threw us into geopolitics, but their statement, right, their statement is that we don't know how to work geopolitically. And our president basically each day announces, hey, right now we are in the center of the world in Europe. Essentially, with the events unfolding, we are in the focal center of news. But okay, you are. Then what are you offering to the United States, to Europe, to China, to Russia? Oh, we don't care about that. No, 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 no. If you are center of the world, you cannot just think about yourself. You have to be bigger. And... This is a sort of a smaller kind of nationalism that when you find your country in the focal point of a bigger picture, you're not experienced enough to offer things to other countries. And we're just developing that. We were growing. And another uh, point would also be that they usually battle is that, yeah, you win this war, but you will not win anything monetarily. The real winner would be West. You will not be using your resources. You'll be paying a big price for all the victories and all the weapons. So there is nothing in the victory for you. And another angle is, okay, going even further. You oh, imagine you won, you got to European Union, you're joined NATO. Do you think you'll be at the big table? 
you'll never be at the big table because you're a small country. You're just a pawn in their big game. And now let me rephrase that. You're not stating the position that you are equal. You do not think strategically. You cannot think strategically. You, the way you talk, people uh, in the West will not be able to treat you as serious partners. Right, right, they like peddling this. And uh, another one, what's the number now, 10? <laughs> if you were with us, our unique Orthodox Christian civilization would have shown the whole world what we are, how strong we are. You'd be equal. You are the same people as we are. You'll be in the same social elevators. We would have joined and you would have gotten more power and you would be able to participate on huge societal and political elevators. On personal levels, you could have been the head of our airspace, you could have been uh, one of the top heads in military, you would be probably one of the highest political establishment. But that's with us. Without us, you probably would be cleaning toilets for the Europeans. So their statement is Ukraine can be a world elite only if they are against uh, West with Russia. This is, I think, very valuable. These are the targets that they are attacking. And on this background, very uncomfortable questions. So when Alexei Aristovich being part of the targets, when Alexei is saying that on the west of Ukraine, somewhere on the marketplace, somebody didn't provide service to a Kharkov citizen who migrated to the west and doesn't really speak Ukrainian and speaks Russian, that she was denied service at some marketplace. And then the, these machines are asking questions, is he part of uh, PSYOP? Well, let's. I want to say that Alexei was uh, doubted for the reason that he his his attack on him was based on the, on the premise that he said that Ukrainian military can be wrong. I want to uh, outline here that the the any psyop is targeting at cutting out pieces of people's statements. Because I suggest a complex storyline. If you take just one story about a woman being denied service in uh, the western of Ukraine, that's one part. But if you take the whole story that I talked, then uh, you see that I was showing that we are a complex country that needs to live uh, in a complex society where we need to accommodate each other. And But that's the bigger picture, which PSYOP doesn't want. They only cut out a piece of it and use it. I do want to bring ethics to inner and foreign politics. But no, I think ethics is far away from the salesperson on the market. Oh no, no, this is part of it. It's a big question to us. Why are we even sitting at this table? What am I doing here? Are we trying to convince everybody? No, we're not. Oh, you're provoking thinking. Exactly. I am. I disinfatuated philosophy with philosophy about five years ago and uh, I am more interested in Sufism in interesting sophistical as aspects of that because that is what asks questions this is where you can actually poke and probe the moment when somebody sends me a letter saying that I have a plan, I know the answer, that is not interesting for me. I usually close such letter and don't read further because I don't have answers for all questions. I know they cannot be probably universal answers and if I'm ready to pose questions, but when the person already has answers to everything, it's impossible to discuss things with them because besides the answers that he already has you will not be able to find with him and i'm interested in, in new questions in new in search of new truths so my answer to ukrainians 
is very simple. We cannot search for traitors in Ukraine. There are no aliens here. They are all ours. We are all ours. There are no traitors. But what do we do with them? We know about General Kulinich, who integrated the lotto in his, uh, under his command with Russian systems and all. Uh, no, no, no. There is a difference. Traitor is is a different. It's it's a uh, it's sort of a so it's a it's an emotional group. It's not a legal group. There is uh, another legal group that is being punished that is being punished legally for certain actions. But this is not that. And what is uh, what are they doing? We're kind of attacking the difference of opinions. This is democracy. It's civilizational democracy as a principle, not like a political setup. Yeah, if you don't think like me, you're a traitor. You're an alien. And in Ukraine, we're all an internal society. We have different opinions. It's normal to have internal conflicts. But they should not be immediately escalated to the question, oh, you work for an enemy. I'll tell you uh, another story. Uh, most of us are not afraid, are not scared by traitorship, as it is. They're mostly scared by the evolutionary advantages that uh, your neighbor will get as a result of it. And we're worried more about the second than the first. I don't know. I'm not sure about that. It is my hypothesis. Right, it's yours. You have a right for that. You know, nobody cares about those people who, those so-called traitors who left the country and left to the West. Nobody cares about them. Those who left the country and moved to Russia, nobody cares about them. But if you are of a different opinion and still living here in Ukraine, you're an enemy. That, that, that's what often happens. And I talk to different Ukrainians who are in Russia. There are some who are very pro-Russian. There are others who are very pro-Ukrainian. And it's funny, there are actually Ukrainian language speakers with uh, Russian who support Russia. Uh, there are interesting groups of people that I, I was kind of uh, researching before they were there. But you cannot, you cannot get them to work this society because nobody cares about them here internally. So look where you end. You are saying that there are different Ukrainians in Russia and it's a difficult story. A difficult story is a very bad thing for PSYOP. For PSYOP, you need simple source that you can use. Uh, complex thinking is uh, like anesthesia to these eternal wounds that society has because it's hard to, to hit you there. The moment uh, PSYOP is attacking something, you basically repel that with, well, now it's more complicated than that. I have my own ideas about it. It's different. So you basically are saying that I do allow myself to go deeper and to accept different kinds of Ukrainians and different reasons who moved where and why. So you let them all be. I'll give you another example. There is a Ukrainian singer who lives in Russia. And while she's not publishing anything about Ukraine, she is not of interest to anybody here. But the moment she posts a picture on Instagram when she was in Ukraine, that's where all shit breaks loose. Everybody goes mad, they remember about her existence, and there is an unprecedented hate wave flowing her wave away. And if she removes the picture, she drops off the radar again. So what uh, our opponents are talking from the second platform. Uh, which platform? Well, you know, the first was like post-Soviet and the second was a sort of national-based uh, platform. And one of the attacks from the second platform, he is not Ukrainian. He is uh, not Ukrainian. And this is presented as a value, as a virtue. He's not uh, Ukrainian, right? 
So, and she says, if we take that singer, she says, I remember Gurzuf, that concert of 2010. And the second platform was attacking her, saying, wait, you, uh, beep, why are you attacking Ukraine? Why are you bringing that? You don't have a right to, to show these things up. You're not Ukrainian. Why? It's my life, she says. It's I'm Ukrainian. No, no, no. You're living there. You're not Ukrainian anymore. Then Nivzorov, when he appeals for Ukrainian citizenship, that was a whole story. It was so painful for that second platform because he is not Ukrainian. How can he be given the citizenship? Why do they uh, peddle this angle now? Uh, it's an old story of uh, ostracism. Why are, is it so important? Because we kick you out because uh, you're not part of society, right? You'll go and die alone. So why is it important for that second platform? Why do you think it is important? I think it's a defensive reaction as a result of oppression of many years. I think they feel that this is a competing, competing advantage, not in general, not in general, but they see it as a risk because right now it's a calculable advantage. You know how you can calculate being a Ukrainian, how advantageous is this? Let's take the primitive level, the volunteer help from the West. If uh, in the volunteer group, imagine people are saying, let's use the complex thinking. How much uh, money will they get from Canada or from the United States? And the other volunteer group is out there saying, we are the, the grandkids of uh, the old Ukrainian troops who fought in the Second World War, and we are against Russians, and we are fighting, and we are Ukrainians through and through. Uh, make a choice which group will, will get more money. It's the simple, the one that peddles the simpler message. So, the other. The other one is basically, I am a true Ukrainian. I was reading all of the Ukrainian fighters in the original. And those people who never did that, they cannot understand the core of our society. And they cannot be part of our real culture. Because only those who can actually consume our uh, cultural works of our ancestors can become that true Ukrainian who will be stronger against Russian indoctrination, who will have their own very special thinking and will be some special right group. And uh, another angle is that why are they doing it? Because Ukrainians never really had uh, power. And it's all like Russians or Jews, or, yeah, Feldman here with a Jewish last name. So this is, a, again, let's skip it with Ukrainians. This is a, another example of cult and magic thinking. Belonging to certain category gives you super abilities. These people actually wholly believe that. I'm reading commentary in the discussion. Oh, J Jews are even not, it's a usual topic, so. Right. Suspected Jew Feldman. Uh, anyway, and, and uh, let's go back to the commentary I was talking. The ones who are actually listening, the ones who are trying to partake in the discussion, some of them are saying, Alexei, you're a genius. You're so great. You're one of the best we have. The only one drawback that you have, please read Dantsov. Then you'll get that super magic uh, capabilities. You'll add another plus 100 points to, I don't know, magic attacks or something and uh, cast the spell over again or something. And I talk back to him and say, hey, I read Dunsov. I read his books. Can you quote Bandera? Oh, yeah, I can. And I can quote Franco even. And then they start asking question. Something is wrong here because the person who read Dunsov and didn't acquire any magical abilities. Why? Do you know the answer they come with? because he's an alien. 
the alien, even upon getting acquainted with our sources, with our literature, cannot even get his cannot get these magic powers even then. For that, you need to read Danzov, Lipinski, Skaropatsky. Oh no, then if you read that, that's wrong and didn't affect you. So let's mention Skaropatsky. He was a single attempt in Ukrainian history to build a right-centric uh, government who opened most uh, editorials, newspapers, Academy of Sciences, translations into Ukrainian was all Skaropatsky, who created the Academy of Sciences. Right, it's like the other figure who had also created the plan of Dnipro Electric Station, who launched a subway, who returned, uh, who, who turned around the monarchy tradition, who was at the core of the Order of Ukraine, because that's another figure from the Ukrainian rebelling army. It's a unique situation. Russian Wikipedia is describing uh, Ukrainian resisting forces uh, during the Second World War better than Ukrainian Wikipedia does. And I want to continue. What did uh, Skaropatsky get as a payment for his work? He was kicked out. Why? Because he didn't didn't speak Ukrainian? Uh, no, because he was the only person with the strategic thinking at that time. Oh, by the way, he also connected Crimea, right? He did, yes. So, Petlura actually gave up some positions in the Western Ukraine. With Skaropatsky, it was growing, but uh, Petlura gave it up. And Petlura is a hero, and Skaropatsky is not, right? The only case of systemic build of Ukrainian country of Ukrainian uh, rule and Ukrainian government. And they did declare Ukraine to be a proper autonomous country outside of, uh, separated somewhat from Russia, but that's how they started, right? But the story is simple, I think. Speaking of PSYOPs, it's very easy to catch us on the main core topic. It's important that your neighbor doesn't get evolutionary advantages. Oh, by the way, we're alive again for a few minutes. And that can be played different ways to present to society and to attack it from different angles and attack figures. And now the other side of it. The other way to fight uh, that and what they're doing is that basically we are watching our neighbor to not get evolution advantages, but how another way to resist that is to gain other evolution advantages ourselves. And we need to be super active to not just, you know, be asleep while he's getting that. And what is the main evolutionary advantage? Uh, complication, evolution? Oh no, that's the third massive, that's our thinking. So the first massive thinks uh, it's got to be Imperial, Soviet, right? Uh, big imperial thing. Second, second massive things. Uh, gotta read the core. Gotta uh, soak in the culture. That gives you plus one to magic, plus one to special abilities, plus a hundred to everything. And your guys talking about some sophisticated thinking here. So our c conflict now is essentially the conflict of uh, magic versus complex thinking. The third and the, uh, the second and the third uh, platforms. Yura, you just joined us. Oh yeah, yeah. I am listening. I see you guys uh, went far, and I see we didn't talk about southern Russia, right, in this stream. Yeah, no, we didn't. Um, that will be a third hour if we touch that space. But I think you will like it. We recorded quite a few things while there was no internet. You'll probably enjoy listening to us. We managed to formulate 10 goals of Russians of their PSYOPs that we touched, we won't uh, count them now, so you can watch the stream. Those who didn't uh, watch us live, you can watch the recorded show by accident, ended up being 10. Nobody really wanted to. All right, the, I will, thank you. And I understand you guys are done, right? 
We, I think we're done. Yeah, we otherwise we'll go for the whole third hour. But I think it's good to stop here. And I, if I remember correct, Alexei has his school coming today, right? Yeah, Yuri, I think we're just at the logical end. When you watch through, I think we went through all the topics that we posted initially and we gave a formal answer at the end. So probably at the end of that way, we should probably conclude the stream. We can probably bring that discussion again up after everybody gets acquainted with what we recorded here. Because uh, it'll probably store a lot of uh, shit throwing here and there, and it'll be torn apart for quotes on the Russian television as well. What's good with our streams? They give uh, birth to more discussions, including even French TV, as you mentioned earlier today. Okay, then we'll talk about Southern Russia more. I thought for another week and came with a few ideas with this concept. Um, probably that's it for today. Uh, hugs and kisses, right? And glad to see you all in the studio. I'll be back soon and uh, see you more. Uh, yeah, cheers to our meetings.